It's the same word we hold dear to ourselves today. It's important that we have a steadfast devotion to the Word of God, fully devoted. Hi, I'm Ron Hammonds and this is Life Shape Prayer and Discipleship. I want to thank you for joining with us today and as you add this block to your life, realize that God is building His kingdom in you and what you will hear today is very important to that process. I also want to encourage you to add an element of prayer to your life, specifically strategic prayer built around 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, God said. Then I will forgive their sins and then I will heal their lands. You know, God was serious when He said that, and He's serious about that today. This truth is being echoed around the nation and throughout the world. God is calling us to humble prayer and strategic discipleship. Set aside some dedicated time. Offer yourself to God. I know if we will, He will. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us here at LifeShape. God bless you and welcome again tonight to Life Shape Prayer and Discipleship. Right here from Southeast Texas, Golden Triangle Church on the Rock, we're opening up our hearts, we're opening up our, the, the, the opportunity that we have to share these life block lessons and this Life Shape Prayer and Discipleship with those around the world. And thanks for joining with us tonight. And also, if you're watching this recorded, especially if you're going to be teaching uh, this, and please do listen to it and then find a place to give it to someone else. If you're doing that, you may wish to download the notes. And uh, if you download the notes and then you, you know, uh, especially if English is not your first language or if English is uh, not the language of those that you're teaching, then we will do everything we can. If you'll contact us right here at ifmypeoplewill.com, ifmypeoplewill.com, okay? Uh, if you'll contact us or right there, if you happen to be watching Church Online or My Online TV, if you happen to be watching either of those and watching this over those broadcasts, then don't forget you can contact us. There's a contact button right there on that screen as well. You can contact us if you need help in getting it translated into a language that uh, is more readily understandable, embraceable uh, where you are, okay? We will help with that. It's our heart, our goal, it's our commitment to provide these training materials to every person in the world who would at all uh, you know, need them or we can reach out to it all. And thanks so much for being a part of Life Shape our prayer and discipleship. Well, tonight is our, uh, here is our 30th time this year to come together. And it just seems like it's, you know, we, we, we're, we're now, uh, you know, we've only got uh, what, 22 more times to come together. We committed to 52 weeks of coming together, opening up our heart in humble prayer and strategic discipleship. Let me remind you one more time, make sure that you carve out time, you know, hopefully every day, and, but at least once a week in, in order to follow 2 Chronicles 7.14 and uh, uh, just follow that along in prayer and then uh, God will guide you, okay? He says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their lands. He meant that. If we will, he will. Don't forget, prayer is the reason we are coming together. But while we're together, we're going to offer ourselves uh, to God so He can put another building block in our life. Tonight, we're in Module 3. Module 3, our new creation responsibilities. That means this, now that I'm born again, what am I responsible to do? What, what is my responsibility toward God? How is it that, that, that He can use me? Not, you know, not just how can I use Him to get what I want. You know, that, that is a, a, a phase of life, a season of life. But also we enter into a season of how can we be valuable to God? What can we do for God? What is our responsibility to this kingdom of God? And that's what Module 3 is all about, new creation responsibilities. And tonight we are on block number four, devotional life. Our devotional life, okay? Uh, a life of devotion. How can we be responsible for the kingdom? Well, we need to be devoted. We need to have our lives devoted to this cause. You know, 
I was reading today, uh, it's not in my notes, but I was reading today and listening to the book of Colossians. I, I'm listening to the book of Colossians over and over and over this week. And, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a short book, so I get to listen to it in several translations. And, uh, and then I get to read it also in several translations. And, and in one of the translations that I was going through today, the New Living Translation, um, in, in the second chapter in verse 6 of Colossians, as I said, it's not in my notes, but it basically tells us that since we have been born again, since we have you know, already come to Christ, it's reasonable that we continue to follow Him, that we ought to walk in Him. You know, since we have come to Christ, it's reasonable that we would continue to follow Him. I mean, since Jesus saved us, it's just reasonable that we follow Him. And that's what our devotional life is speaking to, how we can and should make our lives a devotion to Christ. We should be committed. That's basically what you know, uh, to devote yourself means. Basically to commit yourself wholeheartedly with your whole heart. A commitment that, that is a devotion to Almighty God. And uh, you know, time, time can be broken down. All the time and all the history in the world is broken down into two periods. You all know them as B.C., before Christ, okay? And A.D., you ever wonder what A.D. means? It doesn't mean after death. It was a little boy. I used to think it meant after death. You know, that's what I thought. Uh, and and that's, that's not too bad, but that would give us about a 30-year gap there somewhere, okay? Uh, B.C., before Christ, okay? A.D., Anno Domini, which basically is a medieval Latin term for the year of our Lord since the birth of Christ. And even though this did not come into real uh, uh, use until about the 500s, and there may be a, a, a little, you know, uh, perhaps room for a little margin of error in those, but uh, that's the division of time periods. You know, if we talk about time in history today, we talk about it in terms of B.C. or A.D. Time and history are divided into two different segments. Well, you know, the Bible is also divided into two different sections, two distinct sections, two distinct uh, uh, periods of time, also representing two distinct covenants. You know, the old covenant was written on tables of stone, and it was secured, made secure by the blood of bulls and goats. The new covenant uh, is written in the hearts of believers. The old covenant written on tables of stone, the new covenant written on the hearts of believers, and it's secured by the blood of the Son of God, Jesus, the only begotten of the Father. The first covenant was aimed at sin, and it was based on law. That's the old covenant, aimed at sin, based on law. The new covenant is aimed at righteousness, and it's based on grace. It's just two distinct periods of time, Old Testament, New Testament, two distinct covenants. And uh, the, the first covenant uh, brought judgment and demanded death. Well, the new covenant brought forgiveness and granted life. We know the first covenant is the Old Testament and the, the, the last covenant is the New Testament. Both of them very valid for today. Both of them very applicable and teach principles of life and are the Word of God in every area and every respect. We don't take away from one. Uh, and you, know, you don't have to tear down one to build up the other. Okay? Uh, but they are seen in two distinct lights. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament as it were, uh, is a period of about 4,000 years. It's a picture of God bringing Christ, God bringing Messiah to a lost and hurting world. About 4,000 years, give or take, okay, from Adam to Christ, before Christ. The, the New Testament period, the, the, the time that we look at in the New Testament, uh, as opposed to the Old Testament, the Old Testament covering 4,000 years, the New Testament only covers a period of about 40 years. One generation. The New Testament is a picture of the church taking Christ to a lost and hurting world. And this New Testament period uh, is, is really the account of what one home group did. Okay? One small group, one prayer group. And it's also an example, a pattern example of what every church should do to take the gospel to their known world in their generation. All mankind can also be divided into two distinct groups. You know, history is divided into two periods. Uh, the Bible is divided into two distinct periods. Well, uh, 
all mankind can also be divided into two distinct groups. There are those who do not believe that Jesus is Messiah. That's one group. Okay? I mean, they are a group. That is a people group identified in the Bible. Those who do not believe that Jesus is Messiah, those who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they do not believe that He is the Savior of the world. Some of these people are very good people, and some of these people are wicked and evil. But some of them very good and very kind. However, they're still in that group if they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, and this group of people, no matter whether they're good or bad, they are all without a Savior. And therefore, they are left to themselves to pay for their own sins eternally. They are daily in danger of damnation in hell. That's one group. There's a second group of people in the earth. These are those who do believe in Jesus as Messiah. They have embraced Him as Lord and Savior, and they do not stand in jeopardy of hell or damnation, but rather have an eternity in heaven with Jesus. One group, these two people groups in the earth, one group are the lost. You know, those who do not believe in Jesus, these are lost. They are still living under the law of sin and death. And for their sin, they are required to die. Because they are separated from God, they cannot know the love of God. That's one group. This second group, again, are those who are saved, those who are covered by the grace of God, who will never know separation from God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, this first group, again, these are those that are merely born of the flesh and destined to die. This second group are those who are born of the Spirit, born of the will of Almighty God. One group, again, the children of this world. The other group, the children of God. Mankind can all be broken down into these two groups. Those who believe in Jesus as Messiah, Savior, Lord and King, and those who do not. Those who are destined for heaven and those who are destined for hell. The saved and the lost. Two people groups in the earth. It does not matter whether they are good or bad. We find good and bad people in both groups. We find people who are pleasing to God in some respects, you know, and those who are displeasing to God in some respects in both groups. We find people who are living according to moral values in both groups, and we find people who abandon moral values in both groups. But these two groups are identified as those who believe in Jesus as Messiah and those who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, those who have not embraced Him as Lord and Savior. You know, even the life of every born-again believer is also divided into two periods. Your life, if you have been born again, your life is divided into two distinct periods. Uh, the time passed when you were lost in sin, before you got born again, before you came to believe in and embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then the time since you were born again. Those two periods of life are distinct in my life and in your life. If you were born again, every believer's life can be divided into the life they had before they were born again and the life they have since. Two distinct periods. Although every person who has believed in Jesus as Messiah and received Him as Lord, although every person who is born again is on their way to heaven, yet it is true that not every believer lives the life reflective of their born-again experience. Not every believer lives a fully devoted life to Christ. Not every born-again believer is fully following the will of God for their life. Some Christians, some believers, are even spiritually cold. Some, spirit, uh, spirit, uh, excuse me, some believers, some Christians, some people who have been born again are spiritually cold. They may not be doing anything wrong. They may not be doing anything sinful, but they do not pray. 
They do not read their Bibles. They do not go to the Word of God for answers to life. And they do not attend church. They do not fellowship with other believers. And they are spiritually cold and away from God. Some Christians, some other believers, are spiritually lukewarm. You can be a Christian and be cold spiritually. You can also be a Christian and be lukewarm. What does that mean? That means that you can be in a position where you know, uh, you're only going through the motions of Christianity. There's no real heart. You're here, but you're not really here. You, know, uh, you, uh, uh, you, you, you have no constant commitment to Christ. Up again, down again, on again, off again. You know, your life is not dependent upon the will of God as much as it should be on an everyday basis. There are other things in your life that competes with Christ. And perhaps, you know, you attend church or maybe you even attend several churches, but you're not locked into the place God has for you and therefore not continually charged with the commission God's will is for you, and you might find yourself growing lukewarm toward the things of God. You know, loose commitments to Christ. These believers, uh, you know, uh, uh, are not passionate any longer about prayer, about Bible reading, and about attending the fellowship of the saints. They're no longer driven by the things that once were so important to them. They have slacked off in their devotion and because of that have become lukewarm and if not watchful can become cold to the things of God. You know, it does not mean that they're bad people, but they're simply inconsistent and undependable, inconsistent with Christ and God cannot depend on them in any situation. Uh, often they are disconnected from the real life and the real joy that God has waiting for them if they would take the plunge once again. These Christians confuse the lost. Lukewarm Christians confuse the lost and they aggravate God. Come on, can you put a smile on your face? This is the truth. It's not the easiest thing for a preacher to tell you. But it's important that you hear anyway. Lukewarm Christians confuse the lost more than cold Christians and more than the wicked. Because people see lukewarm Christians going through the motions of Christianity with no heart and no passion, and they see them next week or tomorrow doing something completely different, the in again, out again, up again, down again, on again, off again, Christian the lukewarm who is undependable and inconsistent and, and uh, the lukewarm Christian causes the church more trouble than any other type of Christian. The lukewarm Christian often is the one who, who consumes the church's resources and yet returns very little. There's not only the cold spiritual Christian, there's not only the lukewarm spiritual Christian, but also you can be a Christian and be backslidden. You can be a believer in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and yet living like you have never been born again, living as though you were lost, living in sin with your thoughts, your words, and your deeds, um, belying the fact that you ever knew Christ. You can be backslidden. And although the children of God, you know, uh, uh, are children of God, some have gone back to living like they are children of this world. Spiritually backslidden. You know, uh, those who are serving their own desires. Uh, the heart of God is broken over these prodigal children. And the Bible tells us that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one of these sinners who repents and returns to the Lord than there is over the ninety and nine who have been faithfully serving Him, praying, you know, sharing the Word, going to the Bible for the answers to life, attending church and fellowship and being a good witness. Heaven rejoices when a prodigal child returns home and God can heal backsliding. He can even help with lukewarmness and God can once again light the fire even in a cold Christian's life. The Apostle John, 
who wrote the book of Revelation as Jesus dictated it to him. This apostle John, when addressing the church in Ephesus, uh, he wrote that Jesus clearly expected his followers to live a fully devoted life. Their devotional life was an important responsibility for every believer. Revelation, the second chapter, verse 4 and 5 say this. This is John writing as Jesus was dictating. Jesus said, nevertheless, I have this against you. Speaking to the Christians in the church, to the believers in the church, those born again in the church. I have this against you that you have left your first love. That means that you have pulled away, drawn away, gone away, no longer attached to, vitally and essentially critically attached to what you once were on fire about. He speaks in verse 5, the remedy. He said, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Remember, he said, repent and do the first works. That means that you get reconnected to your first love by plunging yourself back into the first works. He said, or else I will come to you quickly. Suddenly I will come and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He's speaking to the church saying that you would no longer be the light I had destined you to be. This is what we do to heal our backsliding. This is what we do in order to warm up our cold heart toward the things of God. This is what we do in order to help uh, with the lukewarmness as, as Jesus would later say to the church in Laodicea, because you are lukewarm, you make me sick at my stomach and make me want to spew you out of my mouth. I would rather, he said, you would be hot or cold. It's the lukewarm people that aggravate me and give me the most trouble, Jesus said. Uh, I'm paraphrasing that. Remember, repent, and recover yourself. Remember, repent, and do the first works so that you may recover yourselves. God still expects and God still deserves devotion to Him above everything else. Above everything else in your life that may require your time, your talent, or your treasury, God expects us as believers since he saved our soul by the blood of his own son, he believes it's reasonable that we fully follow him. And God still expects and still deserves that we serve him and are committed to him and devoted to him above everything else in life. It does not mean that God does not want you maintenancing your marriage or taking care of your children or going to work and working, giving an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. God expects that, but He expects your devotion to Him to be above your devotion to anything else. Our key scripture for tonight tells us about a devoted people. And it tells us how to get on the path of remembering and returning and recovering ourselves. It's a scripture that is taken out of the book of Acts at a very critical time in the life of a church. It was just at the moment that the Holy Spirit had, had descended upon that home group, that prayer group in the upper room. And here the Holy Spirit baptizing them with a newfound power to be witnesses motivated them to get out of their comfort zone and out of the four walls of that upper room and out into the streets and become a witness. As they began witnessing, people began to get born again. 3,000 people were saved that day and the church was birthed. We find in the lives of these 3,000 new converts, we find them following a certain pattern of life. We see the revelation of their devotion to this new found Savior. Their devotional life still remains as a prime example for us to follow. So look with me if you would in Acts the second chapter in verse 42 so that we might also see how we can begin to live, to strengthen, to shore up, or to return to a devoted life to Christ. In Acts 2.42 talking about these 3,000 believers in the church in Jerusalem, it says they continued steadfastly. They continued. They continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, 
in breaking of bread and in prayers. Through the years and much study, the Lord has allowed me to break these down into some very simple steps and understandable steps. These things that these believers were doing are also essential for us in our day. This is the example that Jesus left us with to follow the example of these fully devoted followers. We too, in order to live a life that's fully devoted to Christ, we must ensure that we do not allow ourselves to become lukewarm, grow cold or backslide into old habits, into bad thoughts or sinful lifestyle. We must develop and maintain a devotional life. How do we do it? By following this example. This brings us to our important points for tonight. Our important points, point number one, a steadfast devotion to the Bible. That's what it's talking about. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We have the Word of God today. We hold in our hands our Bible, which is and a reflection of the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine that the apostles espoused. They did not have this in writing at that time and later wrote it for us. But at that time in their hearts, their minds, in the spirit, it's the same word we hold dear to ourselves today. It's important that we have a steadfast devotion to the word of God, fully devoted so that nothing else can replace the reading, the study, and the instructions we get on a daily or weekly basis by those that God has given to be teachers of the Word in our lives. The instruction of the Word is very important. Our reading, our study, and the instruction from God's Word is essential to living a life devoted to Christ. Without devotion to the Word, believe me, we will become lukewarm, grow cold, and potentially backslide when you do not have a devotion to the Word of God, fully devoted to God's Word. Number two, a continuing devotion to prayer. Not only is God's Word essential, but also the element we find in Acts, the second chapter, in verse 42, is they also continue steadfastly in prayer. It's very important that we communicate with God. Communication is essential in every relationship. Just this week I shared with my staff how that Jesus, after a very long day, he was already tired and looking for a place to rest before he went to that hill belonging to Bethsaida. And there, drawing away so that they could have a little bit of time to themselves, more than 5,000 men, besides the women and children, found them there that day. And after teaching them and feeding them and even sending the disciples away, the Bible says that Jesus then sent the multitudes away by himself. No doubt moving among them. No doubt, you know, shaking their hands, hugging their necks, hearing uh, their testimonies and sharing with them. It was a long day. And about 6 o'clock in the evening, even after that long day, he secluded himself and there he prayed. And prayed, as the Bible tells us, for perhaps 8 to 10 hours before walking on the water and calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. It was a long day. He was busy. He had already said, you know, the day had been long. He was tired. But yet prayer was essential. It is essential for everyone who wants to live a devoted life and fully follow the Lord. A steadfast devotion to the Bible, a continuing devotion to prayer. And number three, our last point, is an unwavering devotion to church. Fellowship and the breaking of bread are best known as things we do when we get together. I submit to you, you cannot fellowship alone. Okay, this communion, this spiritual fellowship and relationship that is a pattern example for us to follow can only be gotten in a group of two or more. And that's what Jesus said. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. That, my friends, is church. It is a very important aspect of church, the gathering together of saints. 
the drawing together for spiritual purpose, for devotional impact, and to accomplish the work of the Lord. The breaking of bread and the sharing of meals together, especially the Lord's Supper, is something that is meant to be done in an assembly, in a joining together, in a people called out of the world and called together in Christ. An unwavering devotion to church. It's very important, believers, that you take these three things serious. In order to fully follow the Lord, you will need to be fully committed to the Word of God, fully committed to prayer, and fully committed to gathering together as a church. Jesus died for the church. He's coming again for the church. If you want to be like Jesus, you will have to go to church. Jesus did.